Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this delightfully cheery November, or November, whoo, not November, January. That's how cheery it is. I'm like, I'm going back three months. January, uh, Sunday, and I think about this time of year, it's kind of slow, there isn't really a lot going on, and we kind of just kind of get into this funk, whether you're missing the sunshine or missing the hustle and bustle of the other times of the year. Um, but what I was thinking about this week is that even in that time period, God is still working, even if we're in a season of rest. And this week was my small group, and we've been meeting together for about two years now, I think we figured out. And um, in that time, we've been praying for things, um, sharing things, and there's been a lot of things that haven't been answered. But it was really interesting this week, all of a sudden, God has been moving in incredible ways, uh, and it's been amazing to see how much energy has been coming through that group. So I just wanted to encourage you that even if it seems dark and dreary out, that God is still moving and still present, and he says these words to us. He said, blessed is the one who does not walk and step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prosper. And so we just have hope knowing that our prayers do prosper in season, but that season is God's season. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this chance to come together as a church body to celebrate you and to rest in your presence. And God, I thank you that you are a God that works in your timing and not ours, a God that answers prayer in the way that you see fit, and a God that answers prayer that would be the most perfect timing that we can't even imagine. I thank you for the different seasons of life, times of rushing and times of stillness. And I pray in this season of stillness, God, that you would speak to us, that you would draw closer to us. I pray for each and every person who's here, who's viewing the service on whatever platform they choose, God, that your spirit would continue to speak to them, whether they watch it today or three weeks from now, God. I pray for all those who are unwell, who couldn't join us today. I pray for all those who are traveling, and I thank you that this church family reaches out to those who are not only here every Sunday, but the ones that can't be here. I thank you for how we grow and reach out to everyone in need. And I just ask now that your spirit would be present during our service today and that our offerings to you would be pleasing. In your name, amen. amen. Well, good morning, church. Oh, that was good. Well, let's stand up this morning. Let's lift our voices to our creator. I searched the world But it couldn't fail me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friends. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again.
song this morning, and um, this was a song I heard a couple weeks ago, and pretty much, I don't know if you guys know the hymn, Blessed, Blessed Assurance, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sure most of you do, um, but it's kind of, it's, it's really just a remake and a twist on the song, and um, I don't feel like I have to explain this too much, but this is our anthem, pretty much, and as we encounter things in life with fear and anxiety, I know it kind of works out with you guys having that thing yesterday, I thought it fit well. Um, the simpleness of it is trusting in God. And I think that's the beauty of this song. So I'm not going to go into it anymore, but let's, let's learn this song together. Blessed assurance in Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. And what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Perfect. 
perfect submission All is at rest I know the author of tomorrow Has ordered my steps So this is my story And this is my song Praising my risen King and Savior all the day long. Cause I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. Trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard. And he answered, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him, that's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail, because I trust in God, my Savior.
the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. For me, for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of angels, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness I'm calling on the God of Mary Whose favor rests upon the Lord I know with you all things are possible I'm calling on the God of David Who made a shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath But I've got my own giants Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you now, how I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of angels, I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you, oh God, my God, I need you. Same. 
the captives then your freeing hearts right now you are the same god you are the same god you touch the lepers then i feel your touch right now you are the same god you are the same god I'm calling on the Holy Spirit Almighty River, come and fill me again Come and fill me again Come and fill me Good morning. I am in absolute agreement with Emily as she spoke about how God was definitely moving this week. Um, there's been a lot going on here in the church, but I'm going to speak specifically about um, an event that we had Thursday night for kids that used to come here years ago and attend youth, inner city youth. And we had 42 kids come here the other night. But most importantly, what I want to say is thank you. Thank you so, so much for your prayers. All, every single song that we've sang tonight has been, or today, has been speaking about the power of speaking to God and the power of our relationship with him and, and calling out to him. And so Joey just sang about um, setting the captives free. And that's what I kind of experienced Thursday night is there was these 42 kids that really are, are being held in captivity. And the prayer was is to set them free. So if you could continue um, to pray for um, these 42 kids that came here, I would truly appreciate it because this is not just a once and done um, thing that they came in here, we prayed over them, we gave them a sermon. It's not about that. It's about reaching them and, and helping them to be released from the bondage that, that they're in, the bondage of the world. So if you could continue um, in whatever um, format that you use in prayer to pray for these, these 42, you don't need their names. God knows who they are. So let's um, go before the Lord this morning and just thank him for the provisions. Um, also, one more thing, Brittany, who typically sits in the back, got married up here last night. So when you see her next week, you might want to congratulate her as well. Um, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for how you continue to work, even when sometimes things seem a little dry, and then you get to work and you move in such powerful ways. So I pray today, Lord, as we are in here getting ready to hear your word, Lord, that you will continue to rush through this church, that your spirit would come through here, God, and just move in the hearts of the people that have come to hear about you, God. And I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, uh, we're going to look at verse 6 today. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Wednesday morning is generally when I start my sermon prep, and I go to my office over at Van Street where my business also is, and um, the mail, I had the mail with me, and before I started, I opened up um, a letter from the city, which you know what? They've decided that they like me so much, they send me letters all the time. 
I feel like a pen pal in, in a way. I just am so excited to open up to see what they have to say. And I opened up this letter, and it was from, um, it was from the cold. And I had violations. They told me I had three violations in an apartment. And so I looked at the violations, and I started to think, okay, like which apartment could this be? I was starting to get warm on my answer. And then I noticed the name of the tenant. And it was someone that I was uh, um, bringing to court to have them evicted. And so, I, and so, of course, when they got the eviction letter, they immediately called the codes department to um, tell them how bad a landlord I was. So I, 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 re- I put the letter down, and I said to myself, game on, okay? And um, in that moment that I said that, I was checked inside my heart was this the right response to those who do me wrong? And it was a simple answer, no, it wasn't the right response, but it was one that I was pretty gung-ho about. Um, Doing what's right is not natural or even easy for us as people. Without God's Spirit to guide us and to remind us of who we are, what we're supposed to be doing, loving our brothers as ourselves, loving God with our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Without that reminder of the Holy Spirit, we get off track pretty quickly. However, Jesus says, it is our seeking after righteousness that brings about a joy and a peace in our life. And in the end, if we seek after that righteousness, Hunger and thirst after it will be filled. Righteousness, believe it or not, can bring a sour situation to a sweetness in the end. Most of the time, though, the problem is, with many of us, we don't work through the righteousness part during the sour time so that God has enough time to turn it around in the end to sweetness. One thing we wrestle with is, do we want to be righteous? Notice the words Jesus chooses to use to to describe our desire for righteousness, one in which he thinks that we should have. He uses the word hunger and he uses the word thirst, something all of us know very well. Actually, I'm finding it very dry today and I have my little water bottle over and I've been sipping it, trying to quench the thirst that I'm feeling. Hunger and thirst cause us to do something many times a day. I wonder, well, I know how many times the refrigerator is opened up daily in search of an answer to this hunger and thirst problem that we have. How many men here stand with the refrigerator open looking in it as a hope to answer this unsolved problem and stand there and look and look and look and say to ourselves, it's not here. We go after food or a drink that will satisfy our desire of hunger and thirst in that moment. And for a moment after partaking of them, we are satisfied. Possibly. But as we know, hunger and thirst are never satisfied, are they? They're not. So we're always in a cycle of hunger, thirst. Then it comes to food and drink and we partake of it, and we're satisfied for a moment, but the cycle continues and continues. If, um, I think, well, well, Genesis chapter 25, verse 29 through 34, th- this is the passage, but you, you'll know it. Um, I guess I was going to read it. That's probably why I marked it here in my Bible, um, so maybe I should, huh? All right. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob 
Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank. Then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Well, in just those verses, we are to come to an understanding of what a powerful desire hunger can be. I mean, it doesn't even seem logical for us in this moment that we would turn away our birthright and what's coming to us for some piece of bread and in some lentil soup. But he's in this position of such incredible hunger from his that he figures he's going to die if it's not resolved. And what good is birthright if he's dead? The power of hunger led him to give away a birthright that was obviously way more valuable than a piece of bread in lentil soup. So we take away from there that we know that hunger and thirst are very powerful. And I know after Christmas, the beginning of the year, a lot of us make decisions that we're not going to let this hunger thing get a hold of us in the way it did the year before, and we're going to get it under control, and we're going to master it, and we're going to do things and all that kind of thing. We all know this drive that we have. With the same strength and demand and desire of hunger and thirst and the frequency in which it is repeated in our lives, Jesus is saying this type of person that goes after righteousness is blessed. We are given this analogy to help us understand how much and how frequent to seek after righteousness in our lives. Seek after righteousness in the same way that you hunger and you thirst in your body for food and water. Since those hunger and thirst pulls us to food and pulls us to resolve the situation, the seeking after righteousness as we do that will resolve something else in our life. As I finished writing this last statement, literally what I just said, a tenant of mine came into my office. And I'm in the middle of writing this sermon, and most people that know that I write the sermons on Wednesday do me a little bit of a favor and try not to bother me. Matter of fact, the most of the people that do call me and say, I know you're writing your sermon, I don't want to bother you. And I'm thinking, about back up and say that one more time to yourself before you call, right? <laughs> but here I am, and, and, and here's the problem, okay, from my perspective. Like, when you're writing a sermon, these things are coming to you sometimes so fast that I can't even spell or write the words all the way out. Lots of times I miss words. And sometimes I feel if I'm interrupted, I'm, I'm not going to get what did I, what was that? And so he walks into my office, and I'm in the middle of this sermon, and I know that he loves to talk. He's got the gift of gab, if you know what I mean, right? So I think I just need to make this short. I say that to myself if I'm sitting at my table and he's come over and he's standing next to me. I'm like, how do I... Get the rent money from him. That's what I need. Give him the receipt and usher him on his way out in like maybe 30 seconds to a minute is what I'm thinking, right? And then all of a sudden I feel God speak to me gently in a very quiet thing. And he says to me, let him stay a while. Okay? And I, I, I didn't have to clarify what a while meant because I didn't have that much time. I'm like, you know, because that now looking back, we say, God, what's a while mean? I wanted to find this. Okay, but I just, I said, fine. And as soon as he realized that I was going to engage, he grabbed a chair, <laughs> pulls it up to my desk and sits on the other side of it. And he's talking, and he has dogs, and he has different things and all that kind of thing. And um, I don't know how it shifted, but the, the conversation shifted. And this is what he said to me. He's looking right across the desk from me. I can almost touch him. He says this, you know what? You have treated me right for so many years when you didn't have to. And I was like, man, you're coming in at the wrong time. I'm working on this right thing right now, and I'm not right. And, and now you're here telling me that I've treated you right. And I was thinking, this guy's been with me for maybe ooh, 15, maybe 20 years. And me and him have a past, right? 
He's broken the contract. I mean, in other words, he owes me money. And maybe I've broken the contract and I haven't fixed things at times or answered his calls when maybe I should have. But he says, you've treated me right for so many times and for so many years and you didn't have to. And he says, you're a good guy. And I said, I'm not a good guy. It's the only reason I'm good. My Bible's open. My screen's up. My message is being written. I looked out and said, the only reason I am is because of this Word of God and the Spirit of God working in my life through the Word. He goes, I know. You've been trying to tell me that for years. Well, let me tell you something. Because of your example to me, because of the way you've lived with me, I've changed the way I've treated others. I said, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, he says, you know the lady next door that I don't like? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know her. (laughs) Me and her have struggled liking each other too. I'm with you. I gave her a Christmas gift of $200 this year. What? There's where my rent money went. (laughs) He says, you know, he says, you know how like, you, you just treat me good and just do nice things for me even though I, I'm not good to you? I, I tried it to her. And then he says, you know what? He's a taxi driver. He goes, boss, I, we all came into work to, at the end of the shift and the boss turned to all of us and said, you're fired, everyone's fired. I'm shutting the business down tonight. It's done. He said, I went home and he says, I started praying, you know? I was like, God, I I need a job, and, like, this is not good. (laughs) Wayne's coming for me, right? You know, I mean, there's there's things like this, and and he prays for two days, and all of a sudden, the boss calls him back and says, hey, I'm going to open up the company again, and I would like you to come back, and only you. He says, well, that's an answer to prayer. So I go in, and I sit down, and I talk to my boss. And he says, you know, Jim, he says, you've been doing the right thing. You've been, you've been treating people right. You've been, even in the midst of things, you, you've been doing right. And I want you back to start this company again. He says, well, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to come back unless you bring this guy back too because he treats people right too. And he stood up and argued for the hiring of another individual. And the boss said, okay, that's fine. But get this, the one he chose also took half of his hours, okay? So it it cost him something to to do the right thing to give this other guy a part of a job back. I said, Jim, I said, that's that's great. I said, that's amazing. And he says, you know what? I just, I'm figuring this out. Life is just better when you do the right thing. I'm like, yeah, isn't it? And Matthew Chapter 6, 33, it says this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness in all those things that you are worried about or concerned about or that are on the horizon that you think have to be looked at. All these things will be, he says, given unto you, but I mean taken care of by me. If you seek first the kingdom of God and the righteousness of it, and you live in that thing, the rest of life will be taken care of as well. Choosing righteousness does not have to have a negative impact, although at times it certainly feels that way to us. As we choose to be the way that Christ was to other people. It seems to be that we're giving up rights or we're giving up inside feelings and all this. To, like when we have to forgive somebody and we have to help somebody and all these things, we feel like they're negatives. But actually, they have an incredible beneficial impact to our lives as we work through these things with Christ in our lives. The truth is, choosing not to be righteous is what brings about a curse in our life. How many people here want to talk about curses? What? I thought it was amazing. I I was excited and I wanted to really look at it. So, you know, I uh, opened my Bible to um, Deuteronomy chapter 27 
where it really it's, a, it's, it's God has given all these things, and it says if you don't do them, your life is going to be cursed. Cursed is the person who doesn't do these things. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. Cursed is anyone who does not honor his parents. Wow. So curse is like the opposite of blessing. So if blessing is, is the idea of being given the ability to be joyful and, and peaceful and, and, and whole, then curse is the absolute opposite of that. The place of chaos, the place of always wanting more, the place of frustration and all that. And so God is saying to them, listen, you know what? You want to be frustrated? Then don't honor your parents. You don't want to be blessed? Then don't honor your parents. If you want life to be hard, then don't honor your parents. If you, if you want to be cursed even more, then carve an idol. Make something else higher than me. Oh, you want, you, you want life hard and you want to be cursed? And go ahead, move the boundary stake of your neighbor's property so that, that you can, in a sense, have more and he can have less. You see, cursed is the person who lives unrighteously. This is what God was telling the, the Israelites before they got into the promised land. He said, I'm setting this life up for you. I'm going to give you a promised land. But you know what? No matter how good the land is, no matter how fertile it is, no matter how big the grapes are, how big the figs are, how the water comes or the honey flows, no matter anything like that, it can be an absolute curse if you don't follow in my righteousness and what I'm asking you to do. So really, when you think about this, when we look at Matthew chapter 5 and this great Sermon on the Mounts, God explains it to us in two ways. For those that need to see the opposite, right? You're cursed if your behavior is unrighteous and you're blessed if your behavior is righteous. So now it seems that we have like two motivating factors here. If you're a motivated person, like if you're going to look for a carrot and stick or, well, a carrot out here and then a stick on the head, you know, if you're looking for those type of things, we're given to them. They're both there before us. We're given... Both sides of the truth. And so Jesus says, you want to solve that, then somehow you've got to learn how to hunger and thirst after what is right. In Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3, God says, come, all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me. And eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Give your ear and come to me and hear that your soul may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. Remember the first four Beatitudes when we introduce the series, we're talking about there are posture that we stand before God with. The question for us to wrestle with is do we want to live our life righteously? And in some way, we stand before God with Him presenting righteousness to us, treating us with righteousness. And, and letting us know what will happen if we choose either direction. And do we want to stay turned to, towards God is the question. And if we are going to live righteously, if that's a decision that we, we want to work on and, and struggle through, we have to understand that we're not going to be righteous by the law but we're going to become righteous by the Spirit in our, in our lives. Our salvation is the declaration of Jesus Christ saying that we are righteous before God as we stand before God with Jesus as, as our side. But the Spirit is getting us more accustomed to what we are and what we should be. If you want to turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 4.
Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain with the help of the Lord and brought forth a man, and later she gave birth to his son Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, but Abel brought fat portions from some of his firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do, but if you, but if you do, do not do what is right. Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Then the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it'll be no longer yield its crop for you. You'll be a restless wanderer on the earth. We can see this question of leaving unrighteousness and embracing God's righteousness play out in the story of Cain and Abel. In verse 5, Cain's offering was not right, and God did not accept it. It doesn't go into details of why or whatever, but what we know is whatever, there was an, there was an expectation by God for, for Cain to come in with something to, to show God that he, he cared for him and, and, and as an offering saying who God was. And it, it truly didn't live up to what God expected which caused the second wrong that Cain did. The first wrong is approaching God with something that wasn't acceptable, and now he becomes angry at God, but takes it out on his brother. And that usually happens in our life because we don't want to deal with God because we know God is right, and so we turn to the next best dog in the room and kick it, right? And God spoke truth to Cain in verse 7. God was up front with him, told him what he wanted, gave Cain time to respond back, gave him an opening to reconsider or to come back with another offering. You know exactly what you need to do. This really isn't a problem here. Like it isn't you not knowing. It's a condition. He gave Cain fair warning. You must rule over this situation in your heart, in your mind that you're dealing with that's making you struggle with doing the right thing, with you becoming righteous. You have to look at this. And if you don't, it is going to devour you. It is ready to pounce on you. It is ready to change your life in an incredible way. And of course, Cain didn't. And the sin became even bigger as Cain then kills his brother and becomes cursed for it. What gave Cain life, the the, the soil of the field, what gave him the ability to have and sustain the land would now not produce any benefit for him going forward. So everything that Cain knew that would give him the ability to have life, God says, now you won't have that. That's an incredible curse. When we think about hunger... And and thirsting after righteousness, it's not just a choice, but it's also a faith challenge for us. Because if we say we want to walk out this door and I want to to live righteously, I want to live in that way, 
we're going to also have to understand that this is a relationship with God, that faith is involved in it, that is going to get us through some of these incredible humps of pride, of fairness, of, of any other doctrine we want to come up with. Do we believe that living in the way that God intended us to live is better for us? Better for our health, better for our mind, better for our soul, better for our neighbor, better for our city, better for our country, better for our world. Do we believe that living in that way that God intended is better? Do we believe that that would be filled? This is the amazing part because Jesus says, look, you will be filled if you live that way. And so the question is, if we live God's way, are we still working out this idea that we won't be filled and we won't crave anymore if we choose God's righteousness? My mom used to say to me, don't eat that snack. Dinner is just going to be in a few more minutes. How many of you had that said to them? Very frustrating. Because I'll tell you what, I wanted the snack. I didn't want that thing that she's cooking on the stove. I want that thing that says, little Debbie, open it up. It's got peanut butter and chocolate. That's what I want is a snack. And you know what she says to me? That's going to spoil your dinner, young man. But the snack would truly satisfy my hunger. For at least some time, right? But it wouldn't benefit my health. And the truth is, I can't eat both. And my mom knew it. You got to make a choice. Are you going to snack or are you going to have dinner? Snack foods are great for you, aren't they? No. They subside hunger, but they are not beneficial for a healthy life. My mom knew that dinner was better. And my mom knew that that would really satisfy and keep me in to the next meal. You ever notice that those snacks never really help you bypass a meal, do they? They just lead you to more snacks. So that says in my life anyways. So if we are to hunger and thirst after righteousness, then we, can, then we can't snack on unrighteousness. See, because if you snack on unrighteousness, you're filled and you don't need to seek anymore for a matter of time. We'll lose our appetite truly for what is right because as we exercise unrighteousness, it becomes habits. And then habits become addictions. And then, and then addictions become big trouble. All of us want to be blessed. There's no one here in the congregation or is listening online that doesn't want their life to be blessed. There's no one that doesn't want to feel joy and happiness and peace and well-being. None of us. And here is God who shows us the way if we're willing to follow the way of God's righteousness. God has given to us two truths today. Cursed you are if you live unrighteously. It's the truth. It's not, it's not that God is... It's, it's like God is just revealing to you, this is going to happen if you go down this road. And the other truth is, blessed is the person who lives righteously. Those are the two truths that are before us. And Jesus has given us a posture, a way to come before God, to go after it with a, with a hunger and thirst to choose what is right. I've been a little personal in some of my examples today. <clears throat> but let me end with one more that happened this week. <clears throat> I called on a <clears throat> an eviction to see where we were on that. Called the lawyer. And I was going over facts with the lawyer, because that's what lawyers deal with is facts. And I said, I've evicted this person because they owe me money, 
and I've evicted this person on time. In other words, I want you to go find another place because me and you can't come to an understanding of how we should c conduct ourselves with each other. So it's time to move on. It's very clear about that. I told the lawyer that's what I want. There's two things. So my understanding was that I won, or that he told me I won, and then I won on both counts. Oh, you're going to get the person out because they owe you money, and you get the person out on a 30-day notice. I said, okay. I said, the lady just called me, and she wants to pay all the money today of what she owes you. I told her what she owes. I said, I'd like to take the money and accept that. And he says, well, if you accept that, that negates the, the judge's order, and she doesn't have to be out. Now, here's the thing. This was decided January 3rd. In all this time, I've been waiting for the lawyer to tell me what happened. And he hadn't. I could have had this person out on January 4th or 5th. And so I get a little bit upset at the lawyer a little bit. And I say, hey, you know what? He could have taken care of this. It wouldn't even be a part of it. This lady wouldn't be giving the money until January 25th if we would have taken care of business. You know? He says, well, listen. He goes, as long as you don't take all of it, she's still got to go. So, but, but he says the law says that you have to take the money that she is going to give you. You have to take the money if they're offering it to you. So you want me to basically trick her and say, uh, I'll take some of the money, but not all of it? That way I can turn around and call the marshal next week and kick her out? I said, that don't feel right with me. Matter of fact, that's not right at all. He says, well, he says, it's the law. Well, I said, well, what about the 30 days? He said, well, we haven't, we haven't done that yet. Now I'm getting fired up. I was like, this is crazy. So I get in the truck, and I'm driving over to see the lady. And I'm trying to decide what I'm going to do here. I just got done writing this message. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. And Deuteronomy says, cursed is the person that does all these bad things. And I'm th pretty sure those bad things end up in the cursed column, and I think, I saw I have this choice to make, right? So you know what I decided to do? I decided to be honest with her. I said, you know what? If you give me that money, you can stay for a minute. But the, you're going to be evicted again because I evicted you for two reasons. I said, because you can't get your house in order, right? She's like, right. And I said, and, and I can't do this because of the other people involved in the, in the, in the house, in the apartment. It just, I just can't continue to do this. So this is what I'd like to do. You owe me all this money, right? Yes. I said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't you give me part of the money, you take the rest of the money, and you go find another house. And she looked at me, and she says, that sounds like a deal. And so I shook her hand that day, yeah, Friday, and made a, made a to deal with her. And as I was pulling away in my truck, she owed me more than she gave me. But I felt it was okay. I felt it was right. I felt fulfilled in that moment. And I did not desire the rest of the money to be fulfilled. See, the Beatitudes can be looked at in another way. They can be looked at this in this way. When the disciples asked Jesus, tell us what is the greatest of the laws, what is the best of the commandments, and Jesus said this, love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, because that's your posture. That's when you stand before God and look at Him are you posturing in that way? Then, the working that out, love your neighbor as yourself. And for me that day on that Friday, I had to look at that person as my neighbor, and I had to look at them and think about how I would want to be treated. And it doesn't matter what the law says, because the law does not have any spirit in it. 
It doesn't have any compassion in it. It doesn't have any way to bring people back from failure. It just tells you you were right or you were wrong. So it seems to me that we will wrestle with this as we walk out the door. Do we want to be righteous? With the truth before us on why or why not? But do we turn to God and say, God, I want to do this? And will we patiently wait for our life to be filled in a time that He sets forth? God, let me go through this months with this person. Months. And I had choices all along the way to be righteous or naughty. To be bad or good or be nice or to, to, to be a little bit, you're driving me crazy, right? But it works out in the end to be better when we do it God's way. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the Beatitudes. We are thankful for the truth in which the Scriptures speak to us about our conduct and our righteousness or unrighteousness before you. We see the law, the words that you've given to us on the stones that Moses handed down to the people, the words of the prophets that have come after him, and then the words of your son Jesus Christ as he walked this earth and said to us, these incredible statements. And Lord, here we are with decisions to make. And so Lord, I just pray that you would just continue to speak to us and help us to do what's right. Help us to hunger and thirst after you and your way. And Lord, help us to exercise this out with our neighbors, the people in our lives that you have brought us into. And Lord, truly, this is beneficial for not only us as Christians, but beneficial for those that don't even believe in you. And Lord, sooner or later, someone will say to us, you treated me right. And because of that, I'm going to change the way that I treat others. Lord, isn't that what you did for us? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God In all my life you have been faithful In all my life you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. In all my life you have been faithful, in all my life you have been so Yeah.
Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen.